over the past few weeks, we've been exploring this idea of developing a rule of life based on the two books, The Ruthless Elimination of Harry and When Church Stops Working. It's all about how we can slow down and become apprentices of Jesus. I've now been living this way of life for the past three or four months, and it's really been an eye-opener for me, as I've shared with you over the course of the last few weeks. I hope you found it useful as well, and can I encourage you, if you have, get a copy of the book and read it through. Be convicted like I was, if that's what you need, to slow down, to stop, and to listen to Jesus. As you read the book, if you read it, you'll notice a lot of the material that we've covered over these last few weeks is taken from it. So as we come to a close on this series today, perhaps the question that we're asking is, what next? What now? Tim, we've heard you say over the past few weeks, we've seen it link in with freedom in Christ, which still continues. But what do I do with this rule of life business? Well, today is all about applying what we've learned and looking at how we can model it in our own lives and within our corporate life as the church of God. So the purpose of this series has essentially been to slow down and take a step back from the hustle and bustle of everyday life in the modern world and look at a different approach to our faith. In the 21st century, there is so much going on around us that we often fail to have time to stop and listen to God. We often fail to have time to stop and observe God. We often are too busy to stop and wait on God. In many ways, in the modern world, we have to be very deliberate about doing this. Otherwise, God gets missed out of our lives, and then we discover we've been running on empty for a while, and we need a spiritual refresher to get going again. We can't simply think that our dose of faith comes from the 90 minutes we spend together in church on a Sunday morning. Our faith is a 24-7 faith, 365 days of the year. To become truly apprentices of Jesus, John Mark Homer talks about living that life of 24-7 faith. We have to see church as a chance to come together as a family to sh sometimes to share a family meal, Holy Communion. We have to see it sometimes to just come and be. Sometimes to come and to serve one another as Jesus did. Now it's fair to say that slowing, solitude, simplicity, desert, Sabbath are all huge, huge topics. And to be honest with you, we could have spent an entire series on each one of those in their own right. But I don't want this to be a series where we just carry on afterwards and forget all about it. Because too often in the church, we spend a series, a time, a season looking at mission, but we take the foot off discipleship. So then we say, well, let's do something on discipleship. So we put the, press the accelerator for discipleship, and we let go of mission. And then we take the foot off the pedal for discipleship, and we focus on evangelism. I don't want that to be a case if we now take our foot off the accelerator. I know that's a bit of an oxymoron when we're talking about slowing down, but I don't want us to stop. I want this to become embedded in the life of the church because I believe that is what God is saying to us in this time, in this season. I believe that because I think these two books coupled look so really so well, coupled with everything that is going on in the world at the moment as we watch the news, as we see things going on, we see the wars, we see all the bad press, we see everything going so quickly that I think it's time that God is saying to us, you need to take this seriously, church. You need to take it seriously. Too often within the church... It's always about, what ministries are you offering? Well, we're offering this ministry. Could we offer this one as well, and this one as well, and this one as well? And so we end up doing far too much, spreading ourselves far too thinly, and not actually achieving anything. Feed the hungry, give sanctuary to the homeless, help the poor. They're all very good things, but we have to do them right. I'm not for one minute saying we shouldn't be doing that, because we know that's what Jesus calls us to do. But what I am saying 
is what if this series has been God saying to the church, now is a time to wait on me, to go into a period of waiting and waiting and waiting for me to tell you when it's time to go. We've touched on waiting a few times in this series. Linda shared with us about being in the desert as a training ground, as a preparation ground. Perhaps this is the time now when God is saying, wait to his church. In When Church Stops Working, I was really taken by the last chapter in the book. In an earlier chapter, one of the headline, one of the chapter titles is Ditch the Mission Statement and Look for the Watchword. Mission statement is something in all seriousness that comes from the secular world. It's a corporate strategy. So that everything is, follows that strategy so we know where we're going. It's a corporate thing. Ditch the mission statement. Making fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Shock horror, the vicar saying, do we ditch that? The PCC wait on God. And we came up a long time ago, before my time, with that statement. Now, I'm not saying that statement is a bad thing. Because I think it is a good thing, and I think it is right about what the church needs. And if we go to the next uh, slide three, please. Sorry, I've missed the slide, which was just a summary of where we are. I think God is saying to us, what is our watchword for the next season? And what is God preparing us for? A watchword is something that resembles Scripture. It's something that comes through from the whole church the whole congregation sharing stories. And we see what's the strand that is going through all of those stories. What's the same strand? What is God saying to his people in this time? Which is one reason why it's so important to share our stories. To share what God is doing in our lives. Because as we share those stories, we listen to what God is saying through them. I, and I know the PCC, believe we are in a season of preparation. It's been shared by some PCC members when Bishop Richard attended last week. But I think this season of preparation is to last a little longer, at least until early 2024. And when that season comes to an end, I believe the Lord is asking us to be ready. I believe he's asking us to be ready to be launched into something new. So what are we being prepared for? What is our watchword? Now, interestingly, one of the case studies in that book, When Church Stops Working, looks at a church. And in 2016, there's a church in America. They spent an entire year resting. They didn't start anything new. They slowed down and stopped. And they spent an entire year resting. That's countercultural. That's doing what Jesus wants you to do. And they didn't decline, but they grew. And actually, in that year of resting, they made so many changes that they've been trying to make for the last 20 years that come 2017, it was a totally new church. Because when the church waits on God... It gives us a chance as a church to really get to know one another on a deeper level and see what God is truly saying. What drives us? What makes us do what we do? Otherwise, we're too caught up in the, it's men's breakfast again, we need to get ready for that. It's ladies' breakfast. It's the encounter. It's communion. We just get caught in that cycle and that cycle and that cycle. What if through this series, we've been learning more about waiting on God in the wilderness to spend quality time with him so we can be more like apprentices of Jesus so that we are truly prepared and ready for when that time comes to be released into action. Now, since I've been here, we've not had any specific drive and mission We've not had any particular focus on the community. 
a large part of these last four years has been spending time learning to love one another and discerning what the Lord is asking of us to become a community, a family, so that we can then go out and show the community outside what that is. But every single time we've been ready to get going, something has happened. COVID, March 2020. Ill health, recurring. Babies, July 21, July 22. Cystic fibrosis, me spending a, needing a bit of extra time to get come to terms with it. A whole myriad of other things. Something has always got in our way when we've said we are ready to go. Why? I started to wonder if it is actually the Lord trying to say to us, the time is not yet. You might want to do that, but it's not in my timing, so wait. And it's taken me a long time to realize that is what God is saying. Because it's countercultural to wait and not do anything. The hierarchy of the church wants to know what's your mission? What are you doing out in the community? How many numbers? What's your numbers? Are they going up or are you in decline? It's all secular ways of, making, of marking success. What the church, the hierarchy of the church don't ask is, what's your discipleship like? How good are people at reading the Bible? Do they know their scripture? Do they really know the Lord Jesus? What has God been doing in your church in this last year? They're not the questions that are asked. We have to fill in a form called Statistics for Mission, which is all about what was our numbers through every Sunday in October? What fresh expressions did we do? What were our numbers? How many baptisms? How many weddings? How many funerals? Not what discipleship course have you done? Not what times have you spent together as a family learning on waiting on God? And I actually think they're the questions that we should be asking. Perhaps then the Lord has been saying, wait. Now going back to the watchword, sometimes the watchword comes in a season ready for the next season. One church, again, going in my church that I was working, their watchword was nothing can separate us from the love of God. And that came to that church in September 2019, and they had no idea what it meant. But what happened in March 2020? Lockdown. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. What's the watchword for us in this season, perhaps for the next season? Now, interestingly, in conversations I've had with people over the last few weeks, and indeed, even this morning in the song, the thing that keeps coming to me is, a light shines in the darkness. That's scriptural. That's right there in the Johannine prologue. It's pretty dark out there at the moment. Everything going on in the world. But we know that the light will not be beaten. Listen to things that are, we, 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 the testimonies that are being shared in this church. Betty shared this morning. It could have been dark. Her daughter has only got third party cover. But the light shined in the darkness. And the other side has taken full responsibility. Does it feel pretty dark for you at the moment? Well, the light shines in the darkness. This morning as we were praying before the service, I was suddenly taken to that banner which has been there since before I started. And it's dark on the outside. But inside is the family of God in the light, in the green. But more than that, we are protected from the darkness by the Holy Spirit represented in the dove and by the cross of Jesus. A light shines in the darkness. Perhaps that is it. I'm not saying it is. Perhaps it is. This morning I was caught when we were singing from the inside out. It talks about a light shining in the darkness. Perhaps we are that light, as we saw in the video, this little light of mine. And when it talks about Jesus, there's three lights. Are we the lights to go out into the community, into the world that is dark? Another book I've been reading at the moment is called Igniting the Beacons by Jill Duff. She's a bishop in the Church of England. She talks about us being beacons of light in the community. I don't know. Maybe it's light in the darkness. We need to wait on God. 
Too often, though, in the church, we come up with objectives. We think they're right, and so we go with them. But we're not afraid. We're too afraid to stop because people get upset. People won't be happy. But sometimes the best thing we can do is to stop because something new will emerge. In a season of preparation, we slow down to allow space for God in our lives so we can truly start listening to Him. When we've slowed down and allowed space for God in our lives, we can often see where He has been and where He is guiding us. So what we need to find in the church is not another mission statement. It's not to reaffirm our current one. What we need to do is go merely beyond stating it as an idea, as seven words. We need to go beyond these five values as, a, as words and start living them and inhabiting them and encompassing them as we move forward together. We don't need another marketing strategy for the church. We need words of life spoken in the church. Not just any words of life, but words of life that come from the God who is God and the God who acts in our lives and wants to know us. Next slide, please. Essentially, it makes our job as the church to amplify the good news of God's encounter, encapsulated in a word of God that's moving in the congregation. If we're waiting on God in a season of preparation, we should not keep rushing ahead with new things, but allow time for the soil to settle. Now, I'm no gardener, but I think the soil sometimes needs to settle before we can do something new. Next slide. Because doing less shapes the community directly for a life together before the living God. If we do less as a church, it will shape us into living life together before the living God. So why explore the ruthless elimination of hurry? Friends, we need to slow down. We need to move away from the busyness of the world. We need to make a personal decision to practice things such as Sabbath, silence, solitude. And as we do that and cultivate the space in our own lives for God to act, this will naturally overflow into the life of the church. And then the church will return to its primary focus of being the hands and feet of Christ on the earth and being a hospital for the broken and not another corporate entity. As much as we might want it to be, it's not about which worship song we sing. It's not about which liturgy we use. It's not about whether we're Anglican or not. Ultimately, it's about being a welcoming space for anyone to come in, feel welcomed into the family, and share a meal together. So as we've explored these different practices of living a less hurried life, some will have resonated with you, some won't. That's okay. We're all different. I'm not trying to say how I live my life is the right way for all of you. You will find the right way to slow down and to use those practices as part of your daily life. But as we draw this series to a close, friends, I want to encourage each and every one of us to make a commitment to look at our own lives Work out how we live a life that is worthy of a follower of Jesus. Then we can achieve a rule of life that works. And I'm going to take us right back to week one with this next slide. When I said to you, what do we mean by a rule of life? It's a common understanding of how we follow Jesus together in such a way that we are transformed into people of love and offer that to the wider society. That's what it's all about. That's what church is about. It's living together as a family, sharing the highs and the lows of life that will come, sharing a meal together in Holy Communion, and reflecting Jesus' love to the world outside. This morning we had a couple of words that came that really felt relevant as we were talking about this, how we, can, we, are, we embody Jesus, we become apprentices of him so we can share it with the outside. 
Dean mentioned the hay bale that's in our cupboard. And there was a, the, the interpretation came through as it's gathered for the harvest and then it's food for the winter. It sustains through those seasons. Perhaps it's about rediscovering the word of God as a church because, boy, do we need to do that. We need to rediscover the word because that hay bale, it's in there, but it's scattered all over the place. We are a family of Christians. And when we leave this place, we scatter out into our community as lights to shine in the darkness. Now, in many ways, that's why today's reading feels so relevant. And interesting, that was actually the reading that was set for the churches today. I didn't change it. Because even back in Paul's time, there was a need to work long hours and toil hard. He tells us that at the beginning of the passage. Surely you remember our toil and our hardship. We work night and day in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. We are the Pauls of today who are called to preach the gospel of God into a secular society, a society that has lost the understanding of what it means to be Christian, a society where anything goes, even if it isn't true, a society that is built on lies and not on truth. We are the Pauls of today to preach the gospel of God, to share this book with people, to share the people in this book who were real people, to share Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. And I think in many ways, if I can just touch on this, that's one of the main issues at the center of this living in love and faith debate, because people are feeling pressure to, from the world to change, and are forgetting that we need to be a church built on the Word of God. That's what this church needs to be. And that's what I want the church to be. But by doing that, it will make us unpopular when we take certain decisions. So what? We're not here to become popular. We're not here to bring everybody in and, and like a football club is. We're not here to bring everybody in like all the Christmas adverts are. We are here to preach the gospel of God and to bring people into the family so that they can have their own relationship with him and join our family and then go out and plant elsewhere. Go out and become a beacon into the community. As we spread out from church, we become lights in the darkness. That is what the church should do. But it has to be built on the Word of God, friends. Because we are here to do something that is far beyond this world. We are here to do something that is far beyond the views. We are here to do the things of the kingdom, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and equipped to do incredible things. So that we too can say like Paul, we worked hard and we preached the gospel of God. The final verse of that reading today feels especially relevant in these times. The Thessalonians received the word of God and they knew it was the word of God. I don't think that can be said of the church anymore. We're in a sad, a sad state of affairs. We have people in the church, even in leadership, who don't know their Bibles. We have people in leadership who preach the gospel of culture rather than the gospel of God. Indeed, I think it's about 10 years ago now, over a third of clergy in one diocese in this country did not believe in the resurrection as true. How can they stand up and preach if they don't believe in the resurrection? How can they call themselves Christian? But if we now go back to the middle of the passage, we also see the wonderfully tender way that Paul tells them that they were treated as children by a father. This is not only something much more than a, it's, sorry, it's something much more tender than a master and slave relationship. It's recognizing how we are in God, that we are his children and he is our father. So by preaching the gospel of God as a father to a child, we are representing the God who created us. We are his children. He is guiding us and he is leading us. So to bring us back full circle, if we are too busy for God, how can we be effective for him? If we are too busy with life, how can we spend time waiting on him? Friends, let's learn to slow down together, please. I beg you. Let's enjoy this season of preparation and waiting. And let's get ready to see what God has in store for us. 
both as individuals and corporally as the church, as the family of God. Let us learn to sit at the feet of Jesus, not with our eyes on our watch going, how much longer, Lord? But let's sit at the feet of Jesus with our eyes fixed on him, savoring every moment of the time that we are with the Savior of the world. Let's wait on him. Because next slide, waiting brings life, not a slow death. So let's wait on God to bring life to his church once again. Amen.